Hi, Karen. Uh, yeah, thank you. And thank you, Alex and the company of biologists um, for organizing this great session and this series. Uh, so yes, yeah, today I'm going to talk to you about timing in development. And I'm going to start by reminding that how invertebrates development is pretty much conserved at the level of the genomic and the cellular rearrangement, but still during evolution, there's been changes uh, in these developmental programs that um, have led to diversification of phenotypes. Um, so one of these changes is related to the temporal code, uh, which is going to determine the timing, the order, and the speed at which tissues develop. So changes in this temporal factor are known as heterochrony in general. Um, so species that undergo heterochrony, they may have distinct temporal codes that uh, act in different tissues. So uh, my point of view was like, if we study a species that has um, a different internal clocks acting in different tissues, we could probably have a better understanding of what's determining timing. And so that's what this project is about. And the, the, uh, the group of uh, animals that we decided to study are marsupials. So marsupials exhibit a short gestation in comparison to other mammals. Um, and they de continue development externally after birth. Uh, so this is a picture of a newborn opossum, which is the particular species of marsupial that we're using that uh, live originally in South America. Uh, and as you can see, when they're born, they are in a very immature state, uh, but still you can appreciate that some of these features are more advanced than others. And that's uh, because they prioritize the, the features that are gonna be more important for the survival. So that includes the forelimbs and uh, because they need to crawl once they're born and uh, all the features important for feeding like all the green facial structures. So as a result, what happens is that they have this gradient in development from anterior to posterior. So again, in, in this work, we could see that a newborn opossum was postnatal day two uh, in this staining of bone and cartilage, they have a much uh, more mature um, uh, tissues in the anterior part than in the, than in the posterior. So I was interested in trying to understand when the first signs of heterochrony emerge and uh, in, a, in a global manner. So there's been quite beautiful studies addressing this in, in marsupials, which was quite striking, but now with the new technologies, we can actually answer this question from a more general point of view. So what we decided to do was single cell transcriptomics in these four stages of opossum development. So we have uh, from the beginning, like right before or when uh, gastrulation is just starting, then uh, in these other states, 9.5, we already have the primitive streak. So these states look pretty much similar to some of the images that Natasha was showing. And then at the 10, the embryo elongates, uh, the first one might appear, and then 10.5, which is more like the early gastrulation. So the neural tube is starting to close, and then some more uh, features appear. So we did single cell transcriptomics in all of this. And the first thing that we did was to sort of put everything in context uh, with other animals. So we, did, we selected the mouse as a, a reference um, species and we, we pseudobulk the cells of all of our embryonic stages and try and did uh, transcriptomic comparisons with uh, mouse available data sets. And something that we noticed is that um, during early organogenesis in our opossum, so day 10 and 10.5, the transcriptome was similar to the transcriptome that is shown by uh, my, my mouse embryos that are morphologically quite more advanced. So at this stage, as I was, I was mentioning, so these uh, opossum members are quite flat. So um, even at E10.5, the neural tube is just starting to close. The heart is beating, but still hasn't looped. So it's just the cardio crescent, the volume are still not popping out. While in the in the equivalent time point um, transcriptionally, morphologically, we see that these embryos are much more advanced. So the neural tube is fully closed, the gut is also closed, the volume is starting to outgrow. So we wonder if this indicates that there's just an advanced transcription of the general embryo, or if we can already see some sort of heterochronies and the anterior part of the embryo is the one driving this um, uh, transcriptomic um, equivalence. So to sort of quantify, could start seeing some priori priority of the anterior part, we decided to do this, what we call an AP priority score. So what we do is just quantify the number of differentially expressed genes from uh, anterior data sets because our embryos were split in anterior and posterior. Uh, so if either the, the number of differentially expressed express genes between the anterior or the posteriors in comparison to an earlier time point uh, is uh, larger or lower. And then 
with this score, we noticed that in, in the opossum, um, this is in Tokta, I'm not sure if that looks like an opossum, uh, but uh, so we see this anterior bias quite striking. So we downsampled the number of um, um, cells to be able to really compare, and it was constantly showing this anterior bias. So then we wanted to see if we could detect this uh, anterior uh, priority at the single cell level. So what we did, again, using the same uh, mouse data sets, we uh, built a reference UMAP using NeuraCrest uh, as one of the classic um, tissues that are known to exhibit a trochon in marsupials. And so here we have labeled them this reference UMAP according to the time point these cells are coming from or the cell type that it was assigned. And then we subset the neural crest from our data sets and embedded on, on projected them on these UMAPs. And what we saw is that this, uh, uh, the cells that are from the from E10 in the opossum are still associated with a migratory neural crest state. Uh, but then the cells that come from these uh, subsequent time point E10.5, they there's a high proportion that they reach a more, more mature um, state like the branchial out or the frontonasal mason kind. And we did the same for uh, another iconic uh, tissue in marsupials, which is the limb. Um, so we know there's this asynchronicity between the, the forelimb and the hind limb. So we follow just the same approach. And then we notice that the forelimb cells here highlighted in magenta are occupying a much more advanced um, part of the of the UMAP, uh, while the hind limb cells were sitting closer to the to the lateral plate mesoderm. So we are actually seeing at the single cell level that this asynchronicity is already occurring in, in during early um, organogenesis. So we decided to focus our attention in four different tissues uh, to try to better understand what is driving this. So we decided to select the neural crest and the limbs and those, those, uh, these two classical examples that have been studied before, and then expand uh, our studies to other tissues that have not been um, addressed before, like the spinal cord or the gut, because we thought it could still be relevant for the, uh, for the survival of the newborns, and they have this anterior posterior component. So today, uh, I'm just gonna talk to you about a couple of examples, uh, the limbs and the spinal cord. So if I start with the limb, um, it was known that both limb fields, the forelimb and the hind limb are specified simultaneously and quite early. So TBX5 here is gonna um, show uh, what's the forelimb field and then PATX1 will uh, highlight the, the hind limb. So both of them are, are expressed that quite early. But then we took advantage of this transcriptum to then compare both uh, cluster of cells and then see uh, if we could detect already some uh, synchronicity. And um, there was a bunch of genes that uh, were enriched in one tissue or the other, but something that uh, grabbed our attention was this group of genes that are associated with limb patterning. So for instance, LMX1B is associated with the dorsal size of the limb, uh, as you can see here in a picture of the mouse, and SIG2 is gonna be expressed in the distal part. So something that happens with the group of genes in other vertebrates is like when they are actually being expressed and are part in the limb, the limb has elongated, has outgrowth. So there's already a, a more elongated structure that is going to be patterned. But in this case, as you can see, it's quite flat. So we were wondering if like there's still some patterning uh, happening at these earlier stages. So we perform RNA fish um, to detect uh, some of these genes, and we first saw that both, uh, I mean, two of these genes, SIG2 and LMX1B, First, there were already more, um, so the pattern of expression was more medial, so suggesting that probably that's going to be the uh, future uh, limb forming part of the uh, of the lateral plate mesoderm. And in cross section, we could see that there's a patterning already taking place. So LMX1B here occupies the more proximal part um, of the whole TBX5 domain, and SIG2 occupies the small distal part. So what we see uh, is that. Despite both uh, forelimb and hindlimb being specified quite early and sort of in parallel in the opossum, then the, the forelimb is already accelerating the, the transcriptional progression, even if morphologically they're still uh, quite flat. So the other example that we'll uh, share with you today is uh, the spinal cord. So the spinal cord is this part of the neural tube that uh, um, occupies, uh, I mean, elongates across the anterior posterior axis. And one of the first things that happen uh, during the, the differentiation of, of this tissue is that they acquire a dose of ventral patterning. So there will be some uh, morphogen signals coming from the, um, 
from the ventral pole, uh, sonic cathode, and then BMP and wind signaling from the dorsal. And then the gradients of this signal are gonna determine different subdomains of the spinal cord that then will end up generating different subtypes of neurons. So we wanted to see if in our, in our opossum embryos, we could see already some of these, some of these patterns similar to what was happening in the, in the lymph limb. Um, so we check, uh, trying to understand what's uh, happening with this pattern in comparing this uh, most anterior part of the spinal cord and the most posterior part of the spinal cord. And we could see that both parts have dorsal and ventral associated markers. So that means that they are already responding to this gradient. And it seems particularly that the dorsal um, marker genes were more um, favoring the anterior part. So probably the, this patterning is progressing from an anterior to posterior manner. So it also happened in Eutherians, that's not new, uh, uh, but we thought that maybe there was most exacerbated. Still, we couldn't identify all of the subdomains. So that means that the pattern is starting, but it's not very quick yet. So, but the other things that we noticed that was more interesting is that there was a group of cells uh, that we identify as, as, new, as neurons because they have these post-mitotic neurons being expressed. So that was a bit more remarkable because normally these uh, genes are normally expressed in, in the mouse once the neural tube is fully closed and the, the, all the, progenic, the neural progenitors have been established. But here we can see again by uh, Aroni Fish that one of these markers uh, is expressed across the anterior posterior axis of the spinal cord, perhaps with a higher density in this. And one of these markers was islet one, which is known to establish one particular subtype of neurons is the motor neurons, which are gonna be important for locomotion activity. So since we need, we know that marsupials, when they're bored, they need to crawl. And so probably these locomotion activities require much earlier than in other um, mammals. We thought that maybe one of the, some of these um, neurons have been already uh, acquiring this motor neuron uh, subtype. And that's exactly when what we saw when we uh, did the uh, RNA fish for this marker, islet one. So this is expressed in the ventral side of the, of the spinal cord, which is where well, it's meant to be expressed. So the difference with other mammals is that it's expressed much earlier. So in other, in, uh, for context, in for instance, in the mouse, once this marker is expressed, the neural tube will be completely uh, closed and then uh, uh, there could be a higher density of neural progenitors. So in general, what we're seeing is like this um, heterochronies in the opossum not only happen because there's a dormancy in the posterior part, but also an, uh, an acceleration of specific um, tissues. So we can see uh, that actually this is uncoupled from the morphological events. So in general, even if I didn't have time to show you everything, what we saw is that there's an early delamination and migration of the neural crest. There's an accelerated differentiation of the neural progenitors into neurons. There's an early proximal distal patterning of the forelimb. And that's an early specification of foregut and midgut compared to hindgut. So this is just the beginning. So now we want to use this uh, data set to try to then understand what mechanisms could be driving all these uh, differences in the patterning and in the temporal um, programs. So just wanna finish there by thanking uh, people in the lab and the, uh, some collaborators and the um, technology platforms and the Institute and happy to answer questions if we have some time. Thanks. Thank you so much. Beautiful work. Um, let me open my questions places. Let's see if we have any. <laughs> have you looked at Hawk's gene expression in the opossum? Um, not by fish yet. So I've looked at the um, um, in the transcriptomic analysis, and it looks like so we get up until Sox, uh, sorry, Hox nine. Uh, and we see, so we have used them to try to identify if some populations were from the anterior, from the posterior. So it could be uh, that maybe the, all the anterior hoxes are like expressed like more quickly and then there's a slowing down in the how the other posterior ones uh, come up. But uh, yeah, I don't have all those data yet. Any other questions that anybody has? I know we're getting to the end of the hour. Uh, the last note about a gradient in development in the gut is interesting. Shouldn't all the gut develop for proper feeding or is milk so nutrient efficient? that there's no need for defecating, kind of what's what's going on there? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. And actually, we don't, I mean, I don't really understand because, yeah, I thought that if anything, if it's really required early, it should be pattern early, but everything at once. Right. So I guess that would indicate that despite the early necessity, there's still this general anterior to posterior gradient that is affecting right. all the structures. So I'm sure it will be formed on time before they're born, but it somehow is not one of the, the hindgut seems to be not one of the priorities. Uh, mm. So yeah, but I guess eventually we'll speed up and catch up before it's, they're born.